Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually all a tremble out to try and follow that performance. Blimey. Um, now, I must move this so I can... Is that okay? Can you hear me all right? Some of you can see me. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, Dostoevsky. Uh, it's funny. I mean, as I was listening to Alison and thinking, I must run home and read Catherine Mansfield again immediately. <laughs> immediately. Um, <laughs> I was kind of thinking there couldn't be a greater contrast between Mansfield and Dostoevsky, but of course that's wrong because they are both truly great, truly serious writers. And actually, there are many ways in which um, they resemble each other, although uh, on the surface, certainly, you would think there couldn't be two more different. I mean, I'm, because I haven't been able to really plan that, I'll leave you to uh, spot the similarities for yourself. But just to, just to take you into my journey with Dostoevsky, I don't know when I first read Crime and Punishment, but I think I was probably quite young. I've obsessively loved Dostoevsky ever since I first read him. Um, and for many, many years, I have um, hawked around my pet project, which is to turn the brothers Karamazov into a 10-part television drama. Um, and uh, I know it will be the best piece of television ever, but nobody's buying, so. <laughs> um, I came to the short stories very, very late, I didn't really realize he'd written many short stories, and I think that's because they always disguise them when they publish them. They put them in a book, and they call it, um, you know, Notes from the Underground or The Eternal Husband, and then in small letters underneath it says, and other stories. They, they put the stories in with a novella, and it's to bring up the length, because it appears to be a consensus that there are not very many very good stories. Now, I think there are not very many stories, but I think that some of them are exceptionally good, and I also think that they... Um, I mean, it, coming to them after I'd read the novels, what I found was that they, they really reveal the spread of the themes and the obsessions in the novels in miniature, but that they also, quite surprisingly, um, show an incredible... Uh, sense of the form of the short story and of a range of, a range of different forms of short story. And that, that hadn't been what I was expecting. I, I, I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I don't know why I should be so cheeky and rude as to assume it, but I, I hadn't expected them to, um, to be so tightly formed. Um, so what I'm going to do is just talk a bit about a range of them and then focus in on the one that I particularly love, which is called the meek one. It's sometimes also translated as a gentle creature, but I think the meek one is a better title for it. Um, and, and just break that one down for you in terms of the, the craft of the story. Um, one of the big differences, I think, between the short stories and the novels is that a number of the stories are very, very funny. Now, you'll get humor in the novels, and it's quite often humor of extreme embarrassment, um, something completely uh, cringeworthy happens, and it, and it becomes funny. The, in the stories... Um, Dostoevsky's more fantastical, and you get some, some wonderfully absurd stories, which are quite reminiscent of Gogol, of, uh, of stories like The Nose or The Overcoat. Um, uh, for example, um, probably the, the most delightful one is, is called Bobok, which can be translated as a bean. Um, and in Bobok, the narrator goes to a graveyard, and he overhears people in their graves bickering as they rot, as they decompose, bickering about their rank in society and who's superior to who. And a, a lecherous, filthy old um, uh, uh, government official leching after a decomposing 15-year-old girl. Um, and they, they, they continue to, you know, talk nonsense, to talk triviality to the moment at which they are reduced to their final, final word, which in this character's case is bobok, a bean. And he just says bobok, 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 and then he... <laughs> dies out completely. Um, so that's, 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 that's one, of, one, of the, one of the fantastical stories. Another one that I like very much is called Another Man's Wife. Um, and in this one, a jealous husband who's trying to chase his wife through a ludicrous series of mistakes ends up under another lady's bed, not his wife's bed, under another lady's bed. And under that bed, there's another jealous husband <laughs> of another lady. And the actual husband of the lady in the bed comes in and hears a sort of noise going on and the little dog that she has, her lap dog, jumps up yapping and dives under the bed and the two men under the bed fear they're going to be exposed. So one of them grabs the dog, strangles it and stuffs it in his pocket. <laughs> it's just, um, most surreal of all, perhaps, is the crocodile. 
where um, a pompous person is swallowed live by a crocodile and finds that it suits him extremely well to pontificate daily from inside the crocodile because large crowds of people will come and listen. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a side of Dostoevsky that is maybe not so well known. Um, a nasty anecdote is, is one that actually moves closer into the themes of the great novels um, in that it, it's an exploration of pride and an exploration of shame and that kind of hypersensitivity to other people's opinions of you that, that makes you almost incapable of action. Um, but it's treated farcically in a nasty anecdote. Um, and in this one, a, a self-important official who's had far too much to drink decides on a whim that he's going to go to the wedding party of one of his clerks. And it's immediately after the emancipation of the serfs. So all educated men are eager to prove that they've got the common touch and they can relate to normal, ordinary people and the lower orders. So he goes along and very grandly and condescendingly talks to the stupid bride and condescends to try and chat to some of these ordinary folk. And they're all very cowed by him initially. But gradually, as the drink flows, they get a bit more rowdy. And eventually, one of them yells out to him, um, quite truthfully, you came to flaunt your humanness. You interfered with everyone's merrymaking. You drank champagne without realizing it was too expensive for a clerk who makes 10 rubles a month. And they had indeed been sending out specially for a bottle of champagne just for him. Um, he's so mortified at this that he drinks so much that he falls face forward into a bowl of blancmange. So we're, we're in fast territory. He starts vomiting because he's so drunk. They can't send him home in this state, so they put him to bed in the best bed in the house, which happens to be the marital bed. <laughs> the poor married couple have to go to bed on a tabletop, which collapses under them before they can consummate their marriage. The whole household is away. I mean, it's ghastly. It's the most embarrassing story ever. Um, but... But what's really interesting is the way that Dostoevsky, having made us cringe and laugh and be appalled and horrified, actually shows us the point of view both of the um, government official who gets so drunk and of the groom um, in sufficient human detail to make us actually acutely feel for them as, as men, as well as roaring with laughter at the ludicrousness of what's happened. Um, so that's a story where there is farce, but the, the willingness of Dostoevsky to enter into, um, a, you know, a character's heart and feelings, even if he's done something despicable, is, is really, really evident. Um, that, that, that business of being completely embarrassed at a party, obviously, you'll recognize from a lot of... Uh, in, it, it, it's a situation that occurs often in Dostoevsky, in the novels as well as the stories. Um, in the double, Mr. Golyadkin is made a laughing stock at a, at a ball that he snuck into that he was excluded from. And um, in Notes from the Underground, the narrator is um, mocked and humiliated at, a, at an officer's farewell party. There's an, an, an autobiographical story, which I couldn't even find in print... I, well, I say it's autobiographical, and I don't actually know, but it felt autobiographical. Um, I managed to get it on my Kindle. It's called A Little Hero. I don't know if anyone else knows it well, but in that, there's an 11-year-old narrator. It's very um, convincingly narrated by an 11-year-old, and he's mortified by um, pretty ladies at a public house party that he's, that he's attending with them. He's mortified by them praising him and laughing at him and pretending to flirt with him. Okay, the story I really want to focus on is the meek one, which is well known, um, and obviously which explores the themes which are central to the great novels. It's guilt, shame, pride, love, um, a mind under terrible, terrible pressure. It's narrated in the first person um, by a pawnbroker whose 16-year-old wife has just killed herself by jumping out of a window. And um, our pawnbroker is a critic of society. He's a loner. He's very proud um, he's a critic of society who, of course, would like to be accepted and honored by it and isn't. He, he yearns to be understood, and that's what he hopes his young wife will do. Um, the pawnbroker basically sets out to tell the story of their marriage um, from the point, you know, at, the, at the, the moment after her death in order to try and understand what's gone wrong. And um, it, obviously he tells this in a, in a self-acknowledged state of confusion and despair. Um, the body's lying on the kitchen table, um, and he's trying to figure out what went wrong. Um, 
it's, it's an outpouring of grief and despair, but when you actually start to look at it, I became quite obsessed by the story, when you start to look at it, it's fantastically carefully structured. And um, I hope you'll bear with me when I actually try to um, deconstruct it and just show you how, how the story works. Basically, it's a short story, but it's in two chapters, and each um, chapter is broken into short sections, which are numbered. So the whole story is ten short sections of between three and five pages each. And in each section, when you come to analyze it, the power passes from one character to another. So you've got an intensely dramatic structure going on. So in the first section, um, he describes meeting the girl and helping her because she's broke. She comes to his pawn shop to, um, with very cheap, very cheap, pathetic bits of jewelry, and he gives her slightly more money than they're worth. Um, so he has power. He's got money and she hasn't. Um, she's 15 and he's in his 40s. That's section one, so he's got the power. In section two, he proposes to her and she hesitates before she accepts, which shocks him because the alternative is that she could marry an evil old shopkeeper who's already battered two wives to death. So in her hesitation, she has power. He's puzzled why she won't take him. Third section... They're married, and she shows love and gratitude to him and shows affection, which he ignores, and he treats her coldly. He treats her with sternness. Um, his reason for doing this is because he wants to break her. He wants her not to love him out of gratitude. He wants her to love him for himself. So he has power. He's, um, he's treating her cruelly. Section four, he suddenly realizes that his cruel treatment of her has made her hate him. So she has power. Section five, he finds out that she's having a tryst with another man, and he goes and eavesdrops on it and drags her home in shame. She, her, her, she isn't actually physically unfaithful to him, but obviously it, maybe it could have tended that way. So having uncovered her disloyalty, he has power. The sixth section, there's a reversal, and that's the bit I'd like to read to you. Um, so the sixth section of the, the meek one... <coughs> What you need to know is that he's dragged her home from this tryst with an officer. She's mortified. And when he went to get her, he had a gun in his pocket, which he thought he might need. When he gets home, he puts it on the table, and he goes to bed, exhausted, and he leaves her. She doesn't get undressed. She lies on the sofa. She doesn't, um, doesn't dare, well, or we don't know why she doesn't go to bed with him, but she doesn't. She, gets undre- she, get, she keeps her clothes on and lies down on the sofa. I woke in the morning at about eight o'clock, I think, and it was already quite light in the room. I woke all at once, with all my mental faculties awake, and suddenly opened my eyes. She was standing by the window with the gun in her hand. She did not see that I was awake and that I was looking at her. Suddenly I saw that she began moving slowly towards me with the gun in her hand. I quickly closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep. She went up to the bed and stood over me. I heard everything. The silence in the room was so deep that I could hear it. All at once I became conscious of one spasmodic movement and I opened my eyes suddenly, irresistibly, against my will. She was looking straight at me, straight into my eyes. And the gun was already near my temple. Our eyes met. But we looked at each other for no more than a second. With a great effort, I closed my eyes again, and in that instant, I resolved, with all the strength I possessed, not to make another movement, not to open my eyes, whatever happened. And it does happen, of course, that a man who's fast asleep suddenly opens his eyes, raises his head, just for a second, and looks round the room, then a moment later, quite unconsciously, replaces his head on the pillow and falls asleep, without remembering anything. When, after meeting her glance and feeling the gun at my temple, I suddenly shut my eyes and did not stir, she certainly could have assumed that I was really asleep and that I had seen nothing, particularly as it is scarcely conceivable that, having seen what I had seen, I should at such a moment have closed my eyes again. Yes, it was inconceivable. And yet she could have guessed the truth all the same. It was that thought that flashed through my mind suddenly at one and the same instant, and... Three cheers for the lightning speed of human thought. If that was so, I felt, if she guessed the truth and knew that I was not asleep, then I had crushed her already by my readiness to accept death. And now her hand might falter. 
Her former determination might be shattered against a new startling impression. It is said that people standing on the great height seem to be irresistibly drawn into the abyss. I suppose many suicides and murders have been committed only because the gun was already in the hand of the murderer or self-destroyer. Here, too, is a yawning chasm. Here, too, is a declivity, a slope at an angle of 45 degrees on which it is impossible not to slip and something seems to force you irresistibly to pull the trigger. But the knowledge that I had seen everything, that I knew everything, that I was waiting for death at her hands in silence could have checked her on that slope. The silence continued, and suddenly I felt the cold touch of steel at my temple, at my hair. You will ask me, did I have any hope of escape? I will answer you, God knows I'm speaking the truth, none at all, not an atom of hope, except perhaps one chance in a hundred. Why then did I accept death? Well, let me ask you in turn, of what use was life to me after a gun had been leveled against me by a human being I adored? Besides, I realize with the whole force of my being that at that very moment a struggle was going on between us, a life and death struggle. I knew it and she knew it, as if she had guessed the truth and knew that I was not asleep. Perhaps nothing of the sort really happened. Perhaps I never had those thoughts at that time, but all that must have taken place, even without conscious thought, yet I have done nothing but think of it every moment of my life since. But, you will ask again, why did I not save her from so heinous a crime? Oh, I've asked myself the same question a thousand times, every time with a cold shiver down my back when I call that moment to mind. But my soul was then sunk in black despair. I was in mortal peril. I was myself on the very brink of total extinction. So how could I have saved anyone? And besides, what makes you think that I wanted to save anyone at that moment? How can one tell what I was feeling then? But all the time my mind was in turmoil. The seconds passed. There was a dead silence. She still stood over me. Then all of a sudden I gave a start of, a start as hope returned to me. I opened my eyes quickly. She was no longer in the room. I got out of bed. I had conquered. And she was conquered. Forever. Okay, there's a little bit more to section six. Um, but obviously what's happened in that section is that she, with the gun in her hand, has power, and he, by, I mean, as he tells us, you know, by seeing her but not moving, um, has achieved power himself. When she lets the gun drop, she's conquered. So it's a in the crisis of attempted murder, power has shifted from her to him. Um, That's the end of chapter one. Um, Chapter two begins with section seven, and in that section she's completely sick and crushed. She becomes ill. She's ill for weeks, and he pays a lot for doctors to come and heal her, but obviously he has power. She's just flat out. Um, Section eight, she begins slowly to recover, but she creeps about like a mouse. She's cowed. Um, But one day when he's in the other room, he hears her singing in a little faint voice. And he realizes when he hears her singing that she's forgotten that he's at home. Um, And he realizes that she doesn't care about him at all. So his response is to throw himself at her, to throw himself at her feet and confess how much he loves her. So the power has gone back to her in that section. Section 9, she apologizes to him for her behavior in the past. She says she'll be a true wife and love him. He's overjoyed. Um, He thinks he's broken her and made her love him for the right reasons. Um, He plans to give up the pawn shop, to take her traveling, to have a wonderful life. He rushes out to buy her a passport. While he's out, she jumps out of the window and kills herself. So the power shifts again from him to her. In the resolution, which is the tenth section, he understands that she despised him and that she killed herself rather than live to be tormented by him. That's what he understands. Um, Obviously, she's dead, so the power remains with her. Now, um, I've spoiled a beautiful story, perhaps, by (laughs) chopping it up in this way. But what I wanted to do for my own satisfaction was to kind of attack the... um, the sort of feeling that I, that I sometimes ca- caught myself having with Dostoevsky, that it was a wonderfully shambolic, brilliantly impressionistic thing that he was doing, because it's not. It's incredibly tightly structured. Um, and uh, Dostoevsky himself, in his introduction to the story, in his forward to the story, 
writes that he's, he's trying to write the realistic ramblings of a grief-stricken man. And I'll just tell you what he says about it. He says, quote, The process of the narrative goes on for a few hours with breaks and interludes and in a confused and inconsistent form. At one point, he talks to himself, then he seems to be addressing an invisible listener, a judge of some sort. But so it happens in real life. If a stenographer had been able to eavesdrop and write down everything he said, it would be somewhat rougher and less finished than I have it here. Still, it seems to me that the psychological structure would perhaps be just the same. Um, so he's, he's told us a story from one person's point of view with you know, the gap of the woman's what the woman thought or felt, we don't know. I mean, it's completely fascinating. You could write a novel that was the woman's story. In fact, I'm strongly tempted to. Um, but, but what he's done is he's, 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 you know, he's, he's claimed that it's, that it's realistic and that it's psychologically realistic, but it's also incredibly tightly structured based on dramatic reversals. Um, and that does seem to me to show in miniature um, a, a wonderful example of the kind of architecture of the novels where you've got um, extraordinary numbers of dramatic reversals, but also in multiple storylines. I mean, in this one, we've only got one person's voice telling us the story, but in the novels, you've got numerous, um, not in Crime and Punishment, but in uh, numerous perspectives um, and, uh, and, and storylines that twist and turn and echo and conflict with one another and counterpoint one another. But that, that very keen sense of drama in the structuring is absolutely um, there. 